Let us look to God in prayer as we begin this message. Father in heaven, we thank thee for the return of another Lord's Day, that we may come before thee to learn of thee, to worship the one living and true God. May the order of our worship be found pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. As we look into thy word, may the Spirit of God be our divine teacher, to teach us, guide our thoughts, that we may focus on thee, take away all hindrances and distractions that may hinder us from focusing on thee. We commit this time into thy loving hands, for we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you ask the average person in the streets, what is happiness and blessings? Some of them would tell you, to be blessed is to have a good job, to have a good salary, to have a house, to be financially secured. Others would tell you, to be blessed is to have good friends, a loving family, and good health. Yet others would tell you, to be blessed is to be free from worries and anxieties. If you notice, they all had something in common. They are all temporal. They are here today and gone tomorrow. How can real happiness and blessings be found in something so temporal? What is blessedness? Let us look at how this word is described for us in the book of Psalm. Let me quote for you some examples. Psalm 2 verse 12 says, Blessed are they that put their trust in Him. Psalm 32 verse 2 says, Blessed is the man from whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Psalm 65 verse 4, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest. Psalm 84 verse 4, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. Psalm 112 verse 1, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Psalm 118 verse 26, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Interestingly, even those who are dead are called blessed. Revelation 14 verse 13 says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Notice all those who are called blessed, they are people who have entered into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. They are the believers who are called blessed. It is a true and permanent relationship with the only Savior of the world. And this faith that they have in the only Savior comes from hearing the word. We all know that Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Those who are blessed are constantly instructed by the word of God and they obediently seek the will of God in their lives and from their lives, they manifest the fruit of the Spirit. My friend, have you entered into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, then you cannot be the blessed man described for us in Psalm 1. If you are, then you need to ask yourself, Am I someone who constantly seek the Word of God in my life? If you do not seek the Word of God in your life, how can you be the blessed man? Because verse 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. When was the last time you read the Bible? 
If the last time you read the Bible was last Lord's day, how sad. Isn't it strange to be called Christians who are saved by the Word of God and say they love the Word of God but yet do not read the Word of God? Let us consider Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3. The title of our message is Blessed Be the Man. Verse 1 speaks about what the blessed man would not do. Verse 2 speaks about what the blessed man would do. And then verse 3 speaks about what would be produced out of the blessed man. Verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The psalmist did not say, Blessed is the king, blessed is the rich man, or blessed is the popular person. But he simply says, blessed is the man. An ordinary man like you and me, a man who is subjected to physical infirmities, a man who has to face the challenges of life, how be it? He's still a blessed man nonetheless. Why? Because there are certain things he would not do. He would not come under the influence of the ungodly. Notice the progression of this verse. He walks, he stands, and then finally he sits. Firstly, he begins by hearing the voice of the ungodly. Then he accepts the way of the sinners, the lifestyle of the sinners. It is no longer the influence anymore. He is now moving from influence to accepting the lifestyle. And then finally, he joins the sinners in their mockeries. It is progression or progressive. Now this reminds us of sin and its progression. Oftentimes when a man falls into adultery, we would just focus on the sin of adultery. But if you think back, long before he has fallen into the sin of adultery, he has already committed lustful sins, sins in his thoughts. Maybe he had gone into pornography as well. Slowly but surely, it escalates until the point whereby he commits the sin of adultery. Sin is progressive. Firstly, the psalmist says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. The ungodly are the wicked who are guilty of sinning against God. All men have sinned against God. They walk according to the course of this world. They are by nature the children of God's wrath. But by God's grace, some of us are saved through the only begotten Son of God. If you are a believer, you are a new man in Christ. As a new man in Christ, your transformed life must cause you not to walk according to the counsel of the ungodly. Counsel can mean advice or wisdom. In other words, you do not walk according to the advice of the world or according to the wisdom of the world. This is a wisdom that is contrary to the Word of God. Today, the counsel of the ungodly can come to us in so many different ways, one of which is the social media. 
Most of us here, we are intrigued by this technology we find in the internet. We want quick answers, we want quick fix, we want to search, click, and that's it. The internet is a good instrument for us to use, but it is also a very dangerous instrument. There are many things that are absolutely ungodly in the internet. The world wants to influence our thinking. And so you see in the internet, people would add their views. Now think about it. When all these people who are ungodly, they come together forming this platform to add their opinions. What do you expect from a group of ungodly people? Surely out of it will come ungodly views, ungodly opinions. So every day of our lives when we go into the internet, we are being open to all these ungodly views. But the believer will not walk according to the wisdom of the world. The world's way of thinking can also come to us through the secular school. In Melbourne, Australia, we have this movement called Safe School. It is actually a good movement on the surface. It is a movement against bullying. Those people who have gender issues, they are being bullied in school. So they came up with this safe school movement that you can stop bullying. But actually, it is an arm of the LGBT movement. It is a very strong arm. And they are now finding out whether or not they can have those who think that they are a girl, they are girls, but in actual fact, they are born boys to use the girls' toilet. And they face a lot of problems because of that. It was slowed down. All these come from the secular school. And people add their views about children giving opportunity to ascertain their own genders. How sad. Singapore is not far away. Singapore is also constantly open to all these Western views. It is very dangerous. It is very ungodly. You know, it is so sad that our children, they spend hours and hours in school, mixing around with their friends, being influenced by the things of the world. And then when they come to church, a lot of them will complain, including parents, that the church has too many fellowship meetings, too many prayer meetings, Bible studies, retreats, Bible seminars. Parents also say, too many for my children. Think about it. All these programs are meant to help your children that they may stay away from the counsel of the ungodly. Which will you prefer? Your children to be influenced by the godly or to be influenced by the ungodly? Every one of us will say, we want our children to be influenced by the godly onto spiritual things. But yet we complain when those resources are open to us. I pray that you will not complain against the spiritual programs of this church. When your children are at home, do they serve the internet in their own rooms? Have you ever thought, what are they doing in their own rooms? What are they doing in the night? 
one of the mothers in my church asked me, what should I do? I'm not very sure that my son is doing the right thing. I tried to tell her that it is best to have a central place in the house whereby everyone can see what are you serving in the internet. It is better to have accountability than to be sorry later. If you want to know how much a person is being influenced by the ungodly, watch his conversation. You know, the more a person listens to the counsel of the world, surely but surely it will influence his speech. The first thing that will change is the way he speaks. He will speak like the ungodly sooner or later because he hears them and then he will speak like them too. Spiritual things which were once primary is now secondary. So ask yourself this question. Do you find yourself listening to the counsel of the world or listening to the word of God? Do you desire to listen to God's truth? Secondly, the psalmist says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. The believer must not accept the lifestyle of the sinners. Now it is no longer the influence anymore. It has impacted his life so much so that he has accepted their way of life. He is comfortable with the values and philosophies of the world. He is all right with what they are doing. Is there any area in your life that you are beginning to accept the ways of the world? Whether it be entertainment, drinking, eating, merry-making. If there's anything that is causing you to be comfortable with the things of this world, take heed. If there's anyone whom you think has influenced you towards the things of this world, take heed. No matter who this person is, you have to separate yourself because the true blessed man will not walk nor standeth in the way of the sinners. He will move away. Thirdly, the psalmist also says, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The believer must never join the ungodly to mock and scorn at the righteous. Have you ever encountered some people who will mock at you because you are serious with God's word? You are serious with Christian fellowship. Just because you are serious, they will scorn at you. You try to tell them about the Bible. You try to encourage them to come to church, to attend the fellowship meetings. And then they would scorn at you and say, you are just like a Pharisee. Or you are being so legalistic, which you are not. It is only because you are serious with God's word. You know, when people are not walking according to the path of righteousness, when they are confronted of their sins, they will always try to defend themselves. And one of the ways to defend themselves is to blame others. And so they will blame those who are walking righteously. They will say that it's because of you. You are so persistent in your Pharisaic ways. I cannot stand it. And they will say all kinds of things about those who are serious with God. 
People scorn and mock at righteousness because they themselves are not doing the right thing. When you are not doing the right thing, you are doing the wrong thing. There's no neutrality in spirituality. It's either you are doing the right thing or you are doing the wrong thing. Some people say, well, I'm just being complacent. Complacency is also a sin. And that complacency will surely lead you to the path of compromise. Surely you will compromise sooner or later. Then you would be walking, standing, and then sitting with the scornful. This has happened to many professed believers, many. We have seen our friends who are no longer with us. They have gone to the world. Today, they are sitting with the scornful. They are comfortable. And then they will look into the church and mock and scorn at what we are doing. When I was very young, I liked to read the comic book Tarzan. You know, Tarzan is a character supposed to be a hero and he is able to garner support and help from all the animals in the jungle. I love to read about this Tarzan. Apparently, he was raised up by the animals. And so because he was raised up by the animals, he was able to communicate with them. He was able to behave like them because he spent so much time with those animals. He could make sounds like them and he could even think like them, behave like them. Obviously, that is not a true person. It is just a story, a comic. But the same goes with those people who stick very closely to the world. They stick so closely to the world, so much so that they think like the world, speak like the world, and then behave like the world. True believers must never be engaged with the things of the ungodly. They must always separate themselves. Then they can be called, Blessed is the man. Are you this blessed man? Verse 2 speaks of what the blessed man would do. Look at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. There are many instances where the psalmist says he takes delight in the word of God. He loves the word of God. For example, Psalm 19 verse 7, the psalmist says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And then the psalmist also prayed in Psalm 119 verse 18, Open thou my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. The psalmist loved the word of God. The psalmist take delight in the word of God. The word delight can mean to bring pleasure. The word of God, the commandments of God, are meant to give us delight. It is not an instrument of oppression. You know, oftentimes people will say, the word of God or the Bible is so oppressive. It is so enslaving. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. The Bible is not an instrument of oppression. It brings delight to the believers to the man who is called blessed. Some time ago, someone asked this question, or said this thing. 
You Christians, you are always being enslaved by the Word of God. You are just like a slave, following what the Bible says. The Bible says this, you do this. The Bible says no, you say you do not do. It's so enslaving. Then I asked this person, which part of the law of God is enslaving? Which law of God are you referring to? Which law? Is it the law that says, thou shall not cheat? Or the one that says, thou shall not lie? Or the one that says, thou shall not commit adultery? If it is the one that says, thou shall not commit adultery, and you are bothered by it, you find that it is too burdensome, something is seriously wrong with you. The Bible brings to us great delight in the Word of God. Because as believers, we know that it is a lamp onto our feet and a light onto our path, without which we will all be groping in spiritual darkness. The reason why we can see spiritually is because the Word of God is able to show us what we ought to do, what we ought not to do. Remember Psalm 23 verse 2 says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Where do sheep feed themselves? Green pastures. Where do believers feed themselves? They feed themselves with the Word of God. The Word of God is able to bring them comfort and assurance. The Word of God is able to give them strength in times of trouble. The Word of God is also able to turn them back to God whenever they stray away from God. When they are troubled and depressed, the Word of God can give them precious promises and hopes. Most importantly, it is God's ordained means to speak to us. This is God's ordained means to minister to His people. If you love God, you, want, you will want to hear what God has to say to you. Before I left Melbourne, or about to leave, my wife said to me that she's already missing me. Thank God for that. If I say that I love my wife, and then the only way of communication is through letters, and when she sends me letter, and I do not want to read those letters, then my love for her is a question mark, right? If I love my wife, and I love to communicate with her, I will probably be reading her letters again and again. Many a times we say that we love God, we love His Word, but do we take delight in reading the Bible, in studying God's truth? We do not have to go to a faraway place in order for us to experience God speaking to us through the Scriptures. Recently, I know that there are many churches going to the Holy Land. And I heard in your prayers that you are also preparing to go to Turkey. There are many churches organizing trips to the Holy Land. Sometimes people would ask, have you been to the Holy Land? And then you respond, no, I've not been to the Holy Land. Not everyone has the privilege to go to the Holy Land. And then they will say to you that, then you miss out something. Because when you go to the Holy Land, you will be able to walk where Jesus walked. 
And then you'll, you'll be able to see how the Bible can come alive. Ever anyone said to you like that? The Bible need not come alive in a faraway place like the Holy Land. The Bible can come alive right here and now. The Bible is God's wonderful words of life. When you diligently seek the Word of God, you will be ministered by the Word of God in ways beyond measures. If you take delight in the law of God, then you must prove it. You will meditate upon it day and night. Every day of your life, every moment of your life, you will want to read the Word of God. Just as I said, if I say I love my wife, then I will desire to spend time with her. I will consider her decisions. I will want to know what are the challenges. Everything about her I want to know. Ask yourself this question. Whatever decisions you are making, do you take counsel from the Word of God? Whether it pertains to your marriage, or whether it pertains to parenting, or you face difficulties in your family life, do you look into the Word of God and find out what has the Bible got to say? Because if you really are serious with God, you want to know what has God to say about this matter. And then you will search. Sometimes you may not understand. Then you seek the counsel of the pastor who is able to expound to you what the Bible says. And then you know that this is the will of God for me. I will do it you find great delight. It is delightful, not enslaving. To meditate is more than just reading the Bible. It is to read about a promise, read about a commandment, read about a certain verse or a certain passage in the Bible, and then let that thought run through your minds constantly. Then you consider it and think about how you can apply it into your life. You meditate upon it at every moment of your life. Because this is no ordinary book. Do you believe that this is a supernatural book? That the Bible is the Word of God? If you know that the Bible is the Word of God, then you would... Not just read it like you read any other books. You will read it knowing that these are the words of my Lord. And ask the Spirit of God to minister to you, illumine your minds, and then convict your hearts. And allow you to understand spiritual things. It is not something that you carry to church only on the Lord's Day or on special occasions like Good Fridays, Easter, Christmas. In fact, it is not even something that you hold in your hand. It is something that you hold in your heart, in your mind, in your life. And then you consider the Word of God at every moment of your life. Such a person is called the blessed man. He not only abstained from the world, but he also is drawn nigh unto the word of God. The outcome of someone who takes delight in God's word and meditate upon it day and night, the outcome is found in verse 3. Verse 3 says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. 
His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So verse 3 speaks of what the blessed man would produce out of his life. In fact, it is not what he will produce out of his life, but what the Holy Spirit will produce. Firstly, the blessed man shall be like a tree planted. It is a planted tree, not a wild tree that serves no purpose. It is a planted tree, tells us that it is well kept off. It is a planted tree, also implies that there is a planter. Someone has to plant it. And we know that God is the one who plants. He plants you and me so that we may serve His sovereign purpose. But there are other plants that are not planted by God. In the Gospel, our Lord Jesus, He said in Matthew 15 verse 13, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to this verse. But let me read for you. Matthew 15 verse 13 says, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. They may stand together with those who are planted by God. The facade may look like a believer, the outward, but then inwardly they are not plants that are fastened by God. These are the plants that will be uprooted. These will be the unbelievers who will be taken out. Those people who dug deep into the Word of God will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. We all know that every tree needs water to survive, just as every Christian would need this spiritual life which comes from the Word of God. Without it, you can have no spiritual life. And notice the Bible says it is not just a river, but rivers. And this tells us the abundance of resources, the abundance of nourishment that the tree would need to produce fruit. Not just to survive, but also to produce fruit. Take a moment and think. You as a Christian in this particular church, thank God for bringing so many people into Gethsemane. Let every member here or every worshipper here think, as a Christian in this church, being surrounded by all the spiritual resources, whether it be Bible study classes, adult, Sunday school, Bible institute, or whether it be Bible weakness, programs, you are being surrounded by all these spiritual programs. Then you also have the encouragements that come from Christian fellowships. Of course, most importantly, you have the wonder working of the Holy Spirit. Are you not a tree? planted by the rivers of water. Surely you say, Praise be to God, I am like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And if you are someone who knows that, you will be very thankful to God for giving you all these resources. You will not be one who will complain why so many Bible study classes? Why so many programs? You will say, praise be to God, I have yet one more resource for me to duck in. There was a member in my church who used to attend the fellowship groups. 
He did not cherish those fellowship meetings until one day he was called away to the outskirts of Melbourne. So he has to travel about three to four hours at the outskirts. And there was a little church. And he worshipped in that little church. They do not have Bible studies. They do not have any programs. It was just a very small church with very little programs, no youth group. Only the elderly are there. And he was so sad. He looked forward to fellowships. The moment he came back, he asked me to allow him to share his testimony during prayer meeting. And the thing he said was, I thank God for all the programs of the church. Until you don't have it, you may not cherish it. But let us take heed that we may cherish it while we have it. Praise be to God for all these spiritual programs that bring forth His fruit in His season. The fruit will not come immediately, but in His season it will come. Surely it will come. The Christian will produce food, not maybe will produce food. Fruit, surely. The difference is in the amount. Some will produce more fruit than others. Some will produce 40 fold, 60 folds, or even 100 folds. Christians are never without fruit. The more you read God's word, the more you are serious with God's word, and you seek to do what God has commanded you, the more fruit you produce to honor the one who has planted you. God not only planted us, but He nourished us with all these resources so that in due time we may produce fruit for His glory. Galatians 5 verse 22 tells us about the fruit of the Spirit. Most of us here, we are very familiar with the fruit of the Spirit that the believer would produce in his life. The believer would bring forth the fruit of love. He's someone who loves God, someone who loves the people around him. He will bring forth the fruit of joy in times of sorrow. He will rejoice in the Lord and he will also cause others around him to rejoice in the Lord. When there are troubles in the church, he will bring peace because he's a peace maker. He's not a troublemaker. In difficult times, he will bring forth the fruit of long suffering. He's patient. And people who interact with him will experience his goodness. He's gentle. He's humble. He's able to exercise self control at all times. The blessed man is someone who will produce all these fruits. His leaf also shall not wither, the Bible says. The leaf is not the fruit. The leaf is an outward sign of life. When you do not know whether the plant is dead or alive, the moment you see the plant with the green leaves, you know that it is alive. In my church in Melbourne, we have our own backyards and front yards. I do not have green fingers. My wife does. So my wife would always plant vegetables, herbs, and sometimes flowers in the backyard. And every time she will water those plants, but come winter time, we do not know whether the plant is dead or alive. Maybe it has been killed by the winter frost. So we do not know. But the moment we see a little green shoot that comes out from the plant, we know that 
Thank God, it is alive. The believer who is rooted in God and His Word is a Christian who is alive, Christian who will bear fruit. Yes, there may be times whereby we are disappointed, there may be times whereby we are depressed, sometimes we feel as if we do not have any spiritual life. Sometimes we feel that we have no gladness to come together like in the past. We do not enjoy Christian fellowship. You know, we face all these struggles and disappointments. Many saints also felt that way. You know the great reformer Martin Luther? He was once so depressed, so disappointed that his wife took one look at him. The wife said, Is God dead? Because you look as if God is dead. But the believer will not remain as someone who is spiritually dead. Because he's someone who is spiritually alive. He may be disappointed, he may be discouraged, but when he turns to God, for His mercy and grace, God, who blessed him with all these resources, will revive him once again. And then all those shoots would come out of his life. Once again, he would be alive. Beaten, but not out. He will rise up again. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. When a man or a woman is blessed with all these rich resources and he takes delight in utilizing God's resources, surely he will prosper. Prosper in whatever he does, not those physical things, not those material things, not the things of the world, but most certainly spiritual things. He will prosper. Because physical things, things of the world, will soon fade away. But what will remain are those spiritual things. Are those things committed to God. How can this man not be blessed? When he knows that whatever he does, he knows that that is God's will because he has already dug into God's word. He takes delight in following God's truth. And if it is the Lord's will, whatever happens, it is God's will for me. And that is the path that I will take. As the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them who are the called according to God's purpose. He knows that. And so I serve God's sovereign purpose, I seek His word, and I know that this is God's will for me, I take great delight. Such a person is the blessed man. He's very assured in his heart. The only trouble is that some people, or most people, they are not sure. Not sure whether, should I be doing this, should I be doing that? Go to the word of God. And when you go to the Word of God, you are very sure that this is the Lord's will for you. Let's say, in regards to your marriage, you pray and you read the Word of God, and this is what the Bible says, and you pray for such a person to come into your life, and you are very sure. Praise be to God. It's a great delight. Is this career for you to take, this path? You pray to God. And the word of God will minister to you. It is the Lord's will. You again take great delight. Parenting, family life, whatsoever. You will prosper. And then, blessed be the man. So my friends, Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3 is a description of the Christian if it is a description of the Christian, 
We need to ask ourselves, does it describe me? Am I someone who is separated from the world? Or am I someone who still wants to constantly go back to the world? Am I someone who is still lingering in the things of the past? Or I abstain myself, separate myself? The blessed man is someone who will not walk, nor stand, nor sit with the scornful. And then are you someone who will take great delight in the Bible? Are you serious with the Word of God? Because if you are serious with the Word of God, whether Pastor Koshi is here or not, whether the leaders of the church, they are here or not, you will meditate upon the Word of God day and night. It brings to your heart such great delight. You love God's Word and you will dug deep into the Word. And then finally you ask, am I a fruit-bearing Christian? What are the fruit that I have produced out of my life? Do I love God? Do I love to serve Him? Am I living righteously? Or am I a stumbling block that others might see my weaknesses? This is the most blessed thing a man or a woman could ever have. When my two sons were born, this is the thing that I prayed most earnestly for my children. Because as a parent, we want our children to have the most blessed thing, right? And to me, the most blessed thing my child could ever have, firstly, is to be in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And next to it is that he must be separated from the things of the world, not the ungodly and the ungodly. And then also that he might love God's word, meditate upon God's truth, and be a fruit-bearing Christian. That is what we desire of ourselves too. Parents, it is good that your children excel in their academic studies, but that must not take precedence over spiritual things. If there be a choice between academic studies and this blessedness, I would rather you choose this blessedness, that your child seriously knows God and separated from the world and is always serious with God's word and also will produce fruit. Then you can say, blessed is the man.